Tom Thumb was an instant success. In city after city, he played to packed houses, and the dollars flowed in. He became a household word throughout the country. In 1844, Barnum, looking for new worlds to conquer, set sail for Europe. In London, Tom opened at a top show place, the Egyptian Hall, and was invited to appear before the young queen. Tom Thumb sang and danced his way into Victoria's heart. She invited him to Buckingham Palace again and again, showering him with gifts and Barnum with gold. Songs were written about him. Statues of him appeared in shop windows. His portrait was painted. Children played with Tom Thumb dolls. He rode about in a tiny coach made by the Queen's own coachmaker. Life seemed to have given the miniature man everything he could want, except someone to share it with him. 21-year-old Lavinia Warren seemed to be that someone. She was 32 inches tall, weighed 29 pounds, and was very beautiful. It was at Barnum's American Museum that Tom Thumb saw her and fell in love. watched from the wings at every performance. Even though he had a rival for her affection, he was determined to make her his wife. After a few months of courtship, Tom proposed to her and she accepted. Their approaching marriage became the topic of the day. Barnum, the master showman, took charge. He invited several thousand guests, generals, admirals, the Astors, the Vanderbilts, the Roosevelts. On February 10th, 1863, they were married at Grace Church in New York. President Lincoln gave them a reception at the White House. Lavinia couldn't have had a better, more loving husband. Even though, to their sorrow, they never had a child, they lived happily together until Tom's untimely death from a stroke in 1883 at the age of 45. Lavinia lived on till she was 78 years old. At the end of her life, she wore a picture of Tom Thumb in a locket around her neck. Although Lavinia had married again, she wanted to be buried close to Tom. Her headstone says only a single word, wife. In life, most people dread the trauma of being different. Freaks come into the world different. And if they make their peace with their tragedy, they become extraordinary people. Extraordinary is the word for another human oddity known as the Elephant Man. His real name was John Merrick. Merrick's story has fascinated millions of people the world over. It has been the subject of a number of books, a celebrated play and a motion picture, which were all inspired from an account published in 1924 by Sir Frederick Treves. The Elephant Man was being exhibited in an empty shop by a showman by the name of Tom Norman, who hoped to make a fortune with him. When Treves saw the Elephant Man, he immediately recognized he had found a medical phenomenon. He asked that he be brought to his office at London Hospital, where he was lecturing in anatomy. Treves had given Merrick his card and had arranged to have him admitted in secret. Merrick came to him that night. The elephant man had to use a disguise so he would not be mobbed by the crowd and seized by the police. He was, in fact, wrote Treves, as secluded from the world as the man in the iron mask. Even though Treves was an eminent pathologist, he had never seen as bizarre a case as Merrick. His scientific curiosity aroused, he proceeded to examine him and photograph him for the Pathological Society of London.
these are the actual photographs he took. Treves said he was the most pathetic specimen of humanity he had ever seen. That his sole idea was to creep into the dark and hide. He had no past to look back on, no future to look forward to. At the age of 21, he was a creature without hope. Treves couldn't help him medically, and he didn't have the authority to take him in as a charity case. Merrick had no choice. He went back to his bleak life with the showman. It was two years before Treves was destined to meet Merrick again. Abandoned by the showman, helpless and penniless, he was rescued by the police from a threatening mob. He asked to be brought to Dr. Treves. A miracle happened. Treves now had a superior position and was able to persuade the hospital to give him two rooms in which Merrick could live. Treves discovered that Merrick's grotesque body concealed an intelligent, sensitive human being. Treves became determined to introduce Merrick to men and women who would treat him as a normal, intelligent man and not as a monster of deformity. He asked a friend if she thought she could enter his room with a smile, wish him good morning, and shake him by the hand. Merrick was overwhelmed at the meeting. He said she was the first woman who had ever smiled at him, the first who had ever shaken his hand. Soon many people wanted to see him and greet him with a smile. He caught the fancy of Victorian society. Duchesses and countesses brought him presents. The Princess of Wales called on him and afterwards sent him a signed photograph. The last five years of his life were the happiest he had ever known. His life was cut short because of his determination to be like other people. Because of his enormous head, he was forced to sleep sitting up. One afternoon, he attempted to sleep prone, like other people, and dislocated his neck. He was found dead in bed of asphyxiation at the age of 28. Most people thought John Merrick was monstrous. But those who knew him felt if we could see his spirit, we would see the form of an upstanding, heroic man, smooth-browed, clean of limb, with eyes that flashed undaunted courage. All the people we've met, Tom Thumb, Julie Pastrana, Chang and Eng, Robert Wadlow, John Merrick, Robert Earl Hughes, Bunny Smith and Pete Robinson, they all had the same undaunted courage. They met tragedy and fought it to a standstill. They took a handicap and turned it inside out, making it work for them. With courage and love, they built themselves a life.